Welcome Internet to the Psychologist Casual Review and today we're going to be reviewing Aggression in Personality Disorders and Perversion by Otto Kernberg. So this is according to me an absolute must read. If you have any interest whatsoever in personality disorders, aggression and perversion, it's for you. Basically it's so far above clinically because he gets so many examples like I think he gives at least 12 to 13 clinical examples, which is a lot. Um, theoretical um, frameworks to work with ideas that allow us to organize our thoughts. And basically, um, true, a true attempt at understanding. And he's very humble. Like, when he says that he doesn't know, he does say that it stays open as a question and he's not going to necessarily provide a fulfilling answer. So all that makes for a beautiful combo of a lot of good sins. And something that I found myself very passionate about. It's not an easy read per se, but it's so interesting. So Kernberg starts his whole framework on his perspective on drives, which is slightly different from Freud's, because for Kernberg, his perspective on drives is the following. That basically the... Um, the emotions are not a discharge of the drives as Freud sought, but are an expression and a manifestation of those drives, as though the drives and the emotions are intertwined and it's a fundamental expression of the drives themselves, that there's no fundamental difference, whereas for Freud there's already a transformation, it's not the drives you get in, in themselves, it's the emotions. So where does that come from? Well, for Kernberg, it comes from what he calls a peak affect, meaning it's, a, it's an affect, an emotion that everyone experiences as in a state of birth or even in the first few months where the emotion is so intense that it overwhelms the neonate and the infant and that they don't have the framework yet to really work through that emotion. They're going to turn towards the adult, quite literally, because from a very early age, they're able to deduce that an adult might be in another room or through the lights or through the noise. So, I mean, very clearly, they, they have that intuition where the adult can help them. And therefore, that help, that care, that love is going to put them into a framing where they're going to be able to do something with a peak effect. A peak effect is no longer going to be destructive hurtful or harmful. It's going to be something that's going to become manageable. And that's what he goes on to say is that basically in personality disorders, that peak effect has not been able to be properly integrated, which has led to hatred and rage and destructivity. And that's something that's very important and we, on which I think is very, very true that the level of hatred uh, in certain personality disorders is immense and it is true that it does come from a frustration and he does point out later on in the book, not necessarily at the start but later on, that basically rage and moments of aggression and of complete hatred come from an intolerable reality, meaning the person cannot tolerate reality therefore they're going to explode into rage and hatred so it's something that's very, I feel, very true and very profound in a way. So basically, that hatred is going to lead to a um, complicated object relationship, meaning the relationship with other people and other humans is going to be de facto so complicated for those people with personality disorders. So in his whole book, it's very, very rich. Uh, I'm just going to go for the bullet point of he differentiates hist hysterical and histrionic personality disorders. So very, very, very quickly, because I made a video, if you're ever interested, please feel free to check it out. But the, the nature of it is basically that hysterical personalities are more organized, mature, have a better choice of objects and can have long-lasting relationships, even though they might have sexual frustrations or sexual issues, whereas histrionic is more manipulative, can do suicide attempts to manipulate others, have choices of partners which are going to abuse them or exploit them, and basically they are more discontinuous, more unstable. And so for Kernberg, the whole point of this book is the idea that 
a lot of those personality disorders are going to be treatable, but not everyone, mainly people with antisocial personality disorder. He says the prognosis is not good, not good at all. And depending on how important it is within an individual, it might um, render all forms of treatment uh, impossible. Um, so basically, we will we'll delve into it later in the video, but you have to understand that for Kernberg there is many levels of organization. The more integrated ones, which have a good superego development, which have a good ego development, meaning the identity of the individual is stable, the person does recognize himself uh, fully and it's continuous. And basically, those are the neurotic levels of organization where the issues are going to be more interpersonal but always linked to reality and the levels of aggression are going to be quite mild. They're going to be more perhaps more provocative or it's going to be more as a reaction to loss of love. Then there is the borderline level of organization where the aggression might be more intense. It might also be more masochistic or sadistic in both fantasies and reality, I meaning the person might indeed have masochistic tendencies or sadistic tendencies. But it's also going to be the fact that they can't integrate aggression fully into the psyche. And aggression is not going to be able to play a role and be transformed as it is in neurotic organizations. It's also anti-social organizations which are more complicated because the superego is not integrated at all, the care and value that place upon others is virtually inexistent and there's a more manipulative element to it. And he goes on to differentiate two types of antisocial, a more active antisocial, which is characterized by aggression, um, drug use, um, intimidation, and um, and very interestingly, a more a one that's not as well known, a passive antisocial, which is more in, intertwined with parasitic behavior, meaning depending on others, exploiting others, uh, living uh, on the financial subsidies of others, and so on and so forth. And I found that as a distinction and between active and passive antisocial very interesting. He also gives the interesting idea that I've never heard anywhere, so I'm going to talk about it here, of this social, this social, that it's people with a neurotic level of organization that are going to have antisocial behavior to conform to a group, meaning that if you had them individually, you, they would not act in that behavior and they would even feel guilt. But because they're in a social setting which um, encourages or forces those types of behaviors, they're going to act upon it, but they don't fundamentally believe it or they're not, how can I say, their ego is not syntonic with them, meaning that they might fundamentally disagree with the actions, which is very interesting, I feel, as a, um, as a subset of difference. And he also goes into basically psychotic behaviors, and that's where I feel that it becomes so rich, because you already have narcissist, borderlines, psychotic, antisocial, neurotic. So we have a lot to deal with, and perversion. So you can see the wealth, and he gives so many examples of every single case. And basically, uh, for the psychotics, what I found very interesting is that for him, when there is a level of psychotic organization like Mrs. N, which she talks about, um, at, at very interesting that she felt that she, people were stealing her vital energy, that they were function, functioning it, that in a way something that's truly delusional. He did state how he brought her back into the therapeutic configuration because for him, what is very important with psychotics because of the delusions, they're no longer in object relationship and they're no longer in the relationship with others and including the therapist, that you should bring them back into object relationship, not through interpretation of the delusion itself because it's too early and it might make them more fragmented than they already are and more disconnected from the person that they already are. But you should try and basically be honest with them and say that your two versions of reality are incompatible. And he does say that that causes aggression, like Mrs. N just told told him, you think that I'm mad? And he, he answered, no, I mean, he didn't answer no, he said, 
it's not a moral judgment. I'm just saying that our true realities are incompatible. And that allowed her to be able to see that there is true sins and that she was on um, in on the level of organization that was not necessarily on the same level as Kernberg and that helped her realign herself with Kernberg um, and go through proper um, psychotherapy and the interpretative aspects of it. That's for so that's for the psychotic elements. And he also talks about paranoia, which is very interesting because it's something where there's a lot of fairy, but there's very little case histories of it. And he does give two examples of paranoia, which is fundamentally important. And in those true cases of paranoia, there's also a case where someone had a psychotic uh, moment where he felt that Kernberg spat on the floor before before seeing him. And when I mean feel, that's my vocab, but he was certain of it. And Kernberg did say that those two realities were incompatible. So that was very interesting. And he also, and I feel that that was one of the core elements of the book and one of the most interesting elements, the idea of ident projective identification. And he goes for a whole chapter where he differentiates projection and projective identification. And I'm going to do a video at some point on the difference and on his fairies on it, which I'm not going to do here because I really want to go into massive detail on those um, true defense mechanisms but very very succinctly very, very briefly it's about projective identification is about how the person's gonna throw an emotion a feeling and a whole pattern into the therapist a pattern that the therapist is not going to necessarily going to be aware of and he's going to act out in a certain way and he gives the examples of many patients for example a paranoid patient, the second example, that basically um, a moment was dating a woman that was working in the same institution as Kernberg and he became enraged and Kernberg was afraid that he might physically be violent with him and that moment where he said that he was afraid, that the patient sadistically was happy, that he made, he put Kernberg in a position of fear and Kernberg said, basically, at that moment, the patient was using projective identification to put Kernberg in the same hopeless position of a vulnerable child that the patient had felt towards a dominating father that was repressive and severe, and that Kernberg was put at the same place as he was as a child. And basically, that's very, very interesting and very honest and very thorough on his behalf to have talked about that and another thing that I really enjoy in this book is that he does so give examples of individuals with projective identification which is incredible but it's, what's even better is that he gave them in the examples of projective identification in an institution and that I think is incredible because that's very rarely addressed by psychoanalysis itself but projective identification does not stop at, in the office of the therapist. It goes on in every domain of life of the patient that has to use it. Because it's often patients with borderline organization, narcissistic uh, features, antisocial or psychotic. And in the case of Kernberg, he talks about projective identification in the hospital, mainly the case of Lucia and Ralph. So for Lucia, it was... Basically, she was manipulating uh, him and the other psychiatrists. She was coming from a very influential family. And she was basically um, getting what she wanted out of them by, seductive, by seduction. Not necessarily sexual, but just through sheer intellect and pleasure um, and pleasure of listening to music, which psychiatrists were um, into and basically... She was also from a powerful family, so there was also that element of fear also and perhaps respect on behalf of psychiatrists. So uh, Kernberg was given that case and at the start he did not necessarily see that manipulative behavior as thoroughly. And, she, and it's through his countertransference and through her actions that he realized that through a dream, and which is a very interesting dream, so apparently in Chile there is that saying where 
if you put your finger in someone's mouth is that you're considering him as a fool. So I'm sorry, I'm not a Spanish speaker and I, and I haven't verified this, but that's what he talks about. And basically, I don't know if I'm restitute giving it to you in the right way but you get the gist there was that saying and he had a dream where she was putting her finger in his mouth and basically he realized that she was playing him for a fool and through that he he was able to um, put limits and basically order the sessions and he said that from there he became he went from a pervasive father that was seductive and okay with um, transgressive elements to a more sadistic and repressive mother in the vision of Lucia, of course, and how after he was dismissed because the other psychiatrists uh, felt that he was not necessarily the man for the job. And so that's how this case ended. And he also gives the example of Ralph, which refused to be taken care of by black um, caregivers and carers but only wanted white people and how the institution just completely gave in it to his projective identification of the splitting of his bad elements, of his own self and his good elements, which were projected onto the white and the bad onto the black, and how the whole institution, because he also was part of a powerful family, played the game and basically became an extension of Ralph's psyche. So it was very good, I felt, that that part was incredibly interesting and thorough. Which also brings us to another important and essential element, I feel, of his whole approach, is the different levels of transference and counter-transference. So he does say that the therapist must feel safe within the relationship. If not, it's not going to work out. There's not going to be no analysis possible if one is fearful. And that's something I fully agree with. And he does say that people with um, with narcissistic features or antisocial features might go through three types of transference chronologically. Meaning they start with what is called psychopathic transference. So here psychopathic does not necessarily mean what we think it means, at, at least on the top of it. For him, it's something that has to do with fakeness, with pseudo adaptive behavior where the person is going to go through the motions but be fake with the therapist and not in that false self kind of way of Winnicott but really like a pretense like they, they know fully that they're not investing into it and they're not investing because they don't feel that there's anything good that the therapist is there for that the therapist is purely there for, for financial gain or for glory because they would publish the case and become famous and so on and so forth. So therefore they, they feel that the therapist is just there to exploit the patient and they don't see the relationship as worthwhile at all. So there seems to be, at least how I see it, there seems to be a dis fundamental distrust of the relationship and a virtually um, complete undercutting of what human relations are that they're, they're, they're virtually inexistent. And in the second phase, when analysis is well conducted and therapy is well conducted, they will enter a paranoid phase where the other one becomes real, but persecutory. And that persecution is going to be thrown out and projected onto the therapist. And at that point, that they're starting to build um, an object, an external object to themselves, like they're accepting to go into the relationship through hatred, through anger, through destructiveness, but it's there and they're able to finally go towards a relationship. And the final stage of transference with those individuals is depression, a depressive transference in which they're going to realize that they're not all powerful, that the other one does exist and has as much power as they do, and that is going to allow them to fully enter object relation at the fullest extent. And that's how basically it, his versions of transference with those types of patients, very interesting, very, very thorough, very interesting, very good. And the last aspect I wanted to fully talk about was this idea of perversion. So coming from France, it is very interesting to, um, to see how he basically states perversion so in France, perversion is a st structure, right? 
meaning that there is psychosis, neurosis, borderline for certain people, and perversion. And he says that perversion is not a structure in of itself, like it permeates the others, like this neurotic perversion. For example, he says it's the Freudian type pervert, meaning people that have a fetish or that substitute um, the idea that women have a vagina for the fact that women have a penis, but that penis is the place on the fetish. Classic Freud theory, right? So he says that that's an erotic level of organization because there's still a superego, there's still ability for tenderness, for love, but it's just that the fetish, fetish, sorry for that, is basically the penis of the woman, but it doesn't necessarily um, culminate with um, with destructive impulses. It's just a deviation from the norm. Second uh, case um, is a borderline organization that has perverse elements. So it might be more rich, like there might be more like frames of how it works. But the problem is that aggressiveness hasn't been integrated, meaning that aggressiveness is destructive rather than enriching uh, the relationship like it would be in the case in normal relationships because aggression sublimates and extends the um, the possibilities of a loving relationship but here in the case of the borderline organization of perversion it's not the case it doesn't and it's often very cold and very masochistic or sadistic and there's the final level antisocial and perversion and he says that that's the one with the worst prognosis. And he gives the example of a patient that would, that was a roofer, so worked on roofs, and would basically masturbate while throwing bricks onto people that were going nearby on the street. And he would climax when he saw the anxiety of the people. And he says that basically he does imply that that if he even if he had killed someone, he would still climax, and that that. That there's no integration of the destruction at all. That the destruction is just fully acted out in the most sadistic possible way. And he says that those ones are the uh, very bad prognosis. So that was very, very interesting in terms of Reed and how he conceptualizes of perversion because it's very different from the French version of perversion itself. He also does make a difference between perversion, the sexual behavior, and perversity. So for him, perversion, the sexual behavior is the is a sexual behavior, obviously, which would be called paraphilia. And there is the perversity. So perversity for him is destroying and transforming what is good into what is bad. It's perverting in the sense of pervertere, which comes from the Latin. And that means basically to twist. So it's twisting or bending what is good and making it bad. So for him, that's perversity, which is which I had already heard of, but very interesting and a good reminder to have it in the book. So basically, all of that is the very interesting point of view on perversion. And there's the only one little caveat is um, the talk about homosexuality. So I would just want to reframe it by saying that Kernberg does not believe that homosexuality is a perversion. But he does say that that might sometimes be linked to character pathology. And it's something that is, uh, I think, of his time because, I mean, it's easy to say that for me because we're 30 years down the line. So I think that when society has accepted homosexuality as completely part of the norm or, or in most Western countries, it's the case. And there's less, it seems to be less intertwined, at least in my clinical experience. And I might, and I might be wrong, but that's what I think and that's what I've witnessed so it's not, um, so it, it is informed. I think that basically uh, perversion is no, can no longer be intertwined with homosexuality. That that's really counterproductive. He doesn't say that, but he does go, go, go into the reviews of all the psychoanalysis that have had that point of view. But he does say that homosexuality can happen and can co-occur with perversion, which Fair enough. I mean, if heterosexuality can co-occur with perversion, I mean, I assume that homosexuality can also. But he doesn't necessarily um, go in the fact that saying... He does say that there is such a sin as normal homosexuality, but he does say that those sins are 
also perhaps prohibited by society. And as I said earlier, 30 years down the line, it does seem to me that indeed now with a more accepting society, we can now call it of the realm of normalcy. But he does not necessarily go that far. But that's also because he wrote it in the early 90s. So I think that it's normal that he did not go that far at that time. And I don't think it's something that should be held against um, the book or against the author. It's just something of its time. But we just have to be able to reframe it in, I think, a more modern and more accurate point of view. So that was the only little caveat. But the book is really brilliant. And I really felt that um, it's well worth the read. And he also talks about counter-transference and his emotions on it. And he things that basically it's very useful and has to be used by the therapist absolutely in personality disorders because it informs so much of the relationship and so much of the dialectic between patient and therapist and also patient and other relationships. And that's something that's fundamental, I feel, about this whole process. But he does say that you have to be careful. You can't just share it like that. You have to share it in an adapted an adapted way, meaning you have to adapt it to the patient and how they perceive things and make sense of it. You can't do it, give it raw and you should never give it raw. It's more a tool for you to think and be able to restitute something of it. So it was a very, very interesting book and I can't recommend it enough, like brilliant of brilliance. And basically, um, I think you should read it. And in the future of this channel, there will be numerous videos because there's things I haven't talked about which I'm dying to but I think it, the video is already long enough and I hope you weren't too bored by my exposition so I'm gonna stop now and I'll see you in the next one thanks and bye